And it's a very exciting thing when a man of his caliber writes a new book. It's been a long time in the, way, in the making, and a lot of us have been waiting for it for some time. He's currently Chair of Energy and Climate Policy at the University of Cambridge Centre for Climate Change Mitigation Research, and Senior Advisor on Sustainable Energy Policy at Office. Of course, is the UK energy regulator. He's editor in chief of the journal Climate Policy, which is the uh, policy of choice for many of us, uh, the journal of choice for many of us working uh, in this field, and is also on the editorial board of Energy Policy. He's recently, a specialist advisor to a House of Lords inquiry, uh, the European Committee. Uh, his former positions include. Chair of the International Research Organization Climate Strategies, which we're now very fortunate to host here at the UCL Energy Institute, which is the sister institute for the Institute of Sustainable Resources. He was Chief Economist of Carbon Trust, Professor of Climate Change and Energy Policy at the College, and Head of Energy Environment at Chatham House, which is when I was first had the pleasure of meeting you, I think. It's a while many, back. Many. A while back. Uh, he's written this book called Planetary Economics. <coughs> That's what he's going to talk about tonight. So please welcome Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Um, I say never start with an apology. I'm slightly embarrassed to say that, of course, I'd been developing various components of this book and present some presentations along the way, and I developed this uh, for this UCL presentation, and I've just realised that I forgot to change the cover slide. So, skirting quickly over the fact that actually I had a fascinating time on a trip to China a month or two ago, where there's enormous interest in this kind of thing, uh, let me dive into the ground I wanted to cover here. Um, Yes, as Paul said, I want to talk uh, about the product of what I'm uh, also somewhat embarrassed to say is pretty much four years since I left the Carbon Trust, uh, thinking, you know, I really want to try and step back and think about what have we actually learned. I mean, we have been bashing our heads over the energy climate nexus for at least two decades, um, and there doesn't seem to be enough thinking about what have we really learned both from the academic discourse around the nature of these problems and energy policy issues etc and from the practical experience and I've been quite fortunate to have quite a, a dose uh, of both uh, in, in my time so I thought I would take a year out write a book get that done move on to something else um, and some four years later I'm finally emerging uh, with the product um, it, it has a sort of uh, suitably immodest title, but, but um, publishers like that kind of thing. Um, it does to some extent capture uh, the theme, uh, providing one accepts that I'm really talking about planetary with a view of the interface of energy and the global environment. <coughs> um, and the subtitle, in a way, is more significant which refers to the three energy, climate, and the three domains of sustainable development. Now, what I want to do uh, in this talk is just to say uh, a, a few words about the nature of the challenge, then to um, key to explain what I mean by the three domains and the three associated pillars of policy. For the purposes of this talk, I'm actually going to focus particularly on the first one of those because the book has ended up being structured with three chapters around each of these three domains and pillars of policy and it's not actually possible to cover them all in depth and I think I'd rather dig a bit more deeply into one of them touch on the other two tell you the integrating story at the end and then if you want to pick up the others uh, in questions that's fine um, and if in, in effect this is the first of three talks that I'll be doing and respectively in the others I mean, in other places in London, I'll be focusing on the other two pillars. So just a, a quick word on the nature of the challenge at a very high abstract uh, level. And I don't want to major on numbers and scenarios. The book is more about concepts and policy principles. But just worth <coughs> saying, 
this is a chart of, in effect, the carbon intensity of the global energy system and its energy intensity, or rather energy productivity, GDP over uh, energy. And uh, there were really quite dramatic improvements in energy uh, efficiency or productivity in the decade after uh, the oil shocks. 1980s inherited, started with unprecedentedly high energy prices, oil prices. Some decarbonisation, but actually we have made very little progress in decarbonisation of the global average mix uh, over the last three decades. <coughs> um, and as you can see from the fact that that was 10 years and now it's 20, energy efficiency progress has slowed quite significantly as well. And so when we blithely talk about, oh, this is global emission reductions this much by 2030, this much by 2050, so we're thinking, okay, so what does that imply? Well, this is a chart for a, one of the typical goals suggested for 2030, and this is the global goal that has been broadly negotiated, considered approximately consistent with the two degree threshold of a 50% global emission reduction. Now, you can achieve that if you're anywhere on this line, this combination, but at the moment you look at it, you think, okay, so supposing we do it uh, all through decarbonisation, uh, little progress on energy efficiency, you've got such a dramatic, utter turnaround in the pace of decarbonisation, it's just clearly implausible to expect that you can change the whole energy, stop production in terms of productive but the other extreme, try and do it all by energy efficiency, and you can just eyeball, you're talking about a dramatic acceleration of energy efficiency, or, again, of a degree that seems completely implausible. The only credible strategy is actually to try and do pretty much as, as much of both as you can and end up somewhere around here. This is the kind of zone that is, shall we say, the, the, the least incredible way of trying to get to global 50% reduction. Obviously, various assumptions about GDP growth and other stuff. That's just a measure and the book is very much trying about integration of the need both to accelerate energy efficiency and decarbonise supplies together and the different kinds of instruments that bear upon that. <coughs> Worth saying uh, that when you unpick the trends in energy and carbon intensity and they're, they're pretty similar as I showed, um, they have varied radically. Now, there are some measurement problems when you take China and go back to how on earth were you measuring its wealth on a comparable basis in 1980, but there's no doubt that the dramatic pace of Chinese economic development has been associated with and unquestionably helped by enormous increase in energy efficiency. But then it started from a fantastically inefficient base. What in some ways is, is more efficient is, and more interesting is First, China and Russia both appear to remain relatively inefficient economies in energy use. You can see the Eastern European countries here, pretty much the impact of preparing and then joining the European Union in terms of varied impacts on efficiency. <coughs> and we still end up in a situation where the rich world, so the developed countries, appear to be pretty much in two groups. You've got in the old world economies, if you like, uh, of, of EU and Japan and the new world economies. Uh, and that is a thing that I'll come back to and, and elaborate further with this chart, which is a slightly complicated way, another way of drawing the history, but this time in terms of per capita CO2 emissions uh, in different regions plotted against wealth, GDP per capita. And I think this chart I find fascinating and really needs to be sort of drilled into people because all of this has shown that there has been decoupling. Actually, the idea that emissions keep rising is just wrong. We have effectively stabilised CO2 emissions for the last couple of decades at least in most industrialised countries. And we have done so at very different levels. You see an apparent stability at very different levels of emissions per capita which corresponds largely to energy intensity and more than decarbonisation. That by and large, most countries, Russia obviously is a fascinating one with its transition, but most countries uh, have, stead there's a steady pattern obviously of increasing emissions up to about ten to fifteen thousand dollars per capita. Uh, the biggest exception, if you like, the most hopeful country in the world, you could say on a really crude metric, is actually Brazil. Though France does pretty well as well. 
But I just think and one, one thing that the whole book tries to stress is, you know, ultimately, my, my first degree was in physics. I think data is central. Economic theory is great, but I like to see how does it stack up against the data. And the number of economic models which are completely inconsistent with all the data that I've shown you is, is fascinating. But um, <coughs> there are stories behind this that I will now try and start to weave out. So, to move on to the structural part of the, well, the book, the book as a whole is structured around this thing, three domains and three pillars of policies. What, is it, what do I mean by that? Oh, sorry, just before I, I explain that, let me just put one other uh, headline. Uh, you will be aware that we have some debate in the UK and Europe about energy bills. Modest little topic, occasionally touches the debate. It's fascinating, it's defined entirely in terms of prices equals bills. The data says that's completely wrong. There has never been any time in history for an extended period when bills are correlated with prices. Actually, what you discover is that the proportion of income spent on energy has been an astonishingly constant thing for pretty much a whole century and across a huge range of countries with enormously divergent prices. And that's a fascinating statistic. And there's a Russian energy scientist called Bashmakov who published a paper on this in energy policy five or six years ago. Um, and you know, again, this is the kind of data I think we need to take notice of, not least because you cannot explain it through the classical measure of price response measured within a given country, which says, well, prices have gone up 10%, energy demand appears to go down 2 or 3%. Elasticity of minus 2.3 are typical measures. It depends a little bit on time scale. This only makes, this corresponds to, a, for those economists here, an elasticity of minus 1. Well, how do you equate that? And that's part of the story I want to tell you. Because in order to explain this data, and I would argue the previous data, you have to actually invoke not just purely price-driven responses, but other responses which may or may not be triggered indirectly by prices or other factors, which broadly fall into two camps. One is around energy efficiency associated regulation, policy and so forth, and the other is innovation throughout energy supply and product change. Now, Price can have some influence on both of those. What I'm saying is the classical measures of price suggest that those things are not nearly as big as they actually appear to be when you then look uh, internationally and long term. It's interesting, this one was supposed to come up in pieces, so never mind. Sorry, just imagine for a moment those weren't there, I'll focus on the central part. Um, because this is the, the, the best that I've been able to do to explain clearly what precisely do I mean by the three domains in e and economic terms. So it's a chart of, in effect, a very simple concept, resource use or energy and emissions or some other input or useful, f useful sort of resource for an economy and what is the economic output, the value that you're getting from that. Now, most of economics is constructed implicitly around the concept of a best practice frontier of some sort in which there are unavoidably trade-offs between the amount of input and the amount of output you can get. Now, the simplest textbooks will actually draw this as a straight line. I've rather unconventionally actually drawn it even going backwards up there because I think there's evidence that countries can actually become over-dependent upon fossil fuels to their detriment. But, I mean, broadly, economics is about searching for the right place on this frontier when actually you have thousands of different resource inputs to the economy. Um, now, <coughs> that sounds simple. Of course, actually, it's not. And one of the reasons why markets are such a useful uh, institutional investment is because the only way to coordinate thousands of different inputs tends to be use decentralized mechanisms through markets mediated by prices. And markets will then deliver, ultimately, uh, the, the, be the best outcome, at least in theory, if they're well structured and prices are telling the truth, and all the usual caveats. That's what I've ended up calling second domain economics, because it is a particular branch of economics, albeit frequently seen as a dominant one, which is based upon certain hypotheses about human behavior, market uh, operation, etc. Now, to the left of this, you've actually got all sorts of spots, crosses here, which represent entities, people, 
organizations, companies, governments, whole countries, which have actually not even made it to the frontier. They're not just you know, finding the best place on there, they haven't even made it that far. Which implies that there is potential for them to improve both, you know, reduce resource use whilst increasing economic output. Now, the fascinating thing is actually every entity in the real world that I have ever stumbled across exists in this domain. I do not know any entity that actually exists at the frontier. And in fact, quite an interesting response from a businessman I asked is, well, no business would place itself at the frontier because you're so fragile if anything goes horribly wrong. You want a bit of wiggle, you know. Anyway, debates about that. Point is, the real world is always somewhere short of the idea of even working out how to make the right trade-offs. Now, this is not unknown in economics. Indeed, it was coined as satisficing theory, satisficing behaviour more than 50 years ago. I think it's fair to say that most of economics then sort of ignored the phenomena, haven't it? given it a decent name, sort of said, OK, well, people don't seem to be optimising in the way they should, but, yeah, don't know quite what to do about that, because clearly they should and they will ultimately, given time. I want to spend part of this talk explaining why this is so important, why it exists, why it is real, and what one can do uh, to, in effect, harness it. But that's, in effect, satisficing behaviour, or the first domain, is all the stuff that happens when you haven't even made it to, to having to make the trade-offs at the frontier because of the options available. Now, the third, the third domain is simply the other side of this curve, that, of course, this is not static. Technologies evolve, systems evolve. This thing will move over time so that you can get more output out of the same input. That's what a lot of innovation is about. Again, statement of the obvious. What is significant, though, is that I'm not referring to, in effect, just the fact that this curve moves, because anyone can analyze and model believe that, but how it moves. Because by and large, the simplest assumption in most economic analysis is to assume that it moves exogenously. The cost of a get technology in 20 years' time will be this much. Actually, how that curve moves, what technologies emerge, what their costs are, is strongly affected by economic conditions and other factors, as many of you in this room will know. A lot of literature on endogenous technical change, not exogenous. It doesn't fall like manna from heaven, it's generated within the economic system. So you can take a business as usual innovation and argue actually probably drives us up in that direction, more emissions. Uh, you could put on a carbon price which would tend to drive the system down this way and tend to drive innovation in that direction, but it would come at a cost. If you like, the holy grail is whether one can have a credible strategy of accelerated low carbon innovation which both pulls the curve down and accelerates its movement. That broadly is what third domain economics is about. So, um, so it's innovation, the evolution of complex systems. Um, one obvious possible re response to that structure is to say, well, that, that's all very well, but actually it is really the economics of trade-offs that matters, and these other things are kind of interesting observations, but they're not very important. Um, so then at least you are in an empirical quantitative discussion, which is frankly where I want to be in this whole analysis. There are many lines of evidence. This is a highly controversial one in the academic sphere, although interestingly it gets taken much more face value in the government sphere in my experience. It's a cost curve. I would guess most of you have seen cost curves before. Slightly mixed reaction. So maybe so. It's basically just a measure of the cost of cutting emissions versus the volume of emissions that you're cutting. And um, I, I found it fascinating actually working. This, this, this incidentally is a global cost curve. You can generate the data generated by McKinsey. We've stripped out the land use because I'm looking at the energy sector. And uh, quite a lot of academics hate this. Um, the reason is the sophisticated ones who you know, were doing cost curves the previous 10, 20 years. One is they don't see why McKinsey should get all of the credit and all of the money for generating a global cost curve because academics have been doing it for a couple of decades. Uh, the other is because a sizable proportion, particularly of, energy, uh, of economists, say, well, clearly there's something wrong here because this can't exist. I mean, why would you have something which would both reduce energy and, save, and emissions and save you money? People would do it anyway. Well, so the significance is, this is where the whole first domain issues come in, I will drill in. The question then 
is, in my view, not does it exist, but how real is it in terms of hidden costs, other things I'll say a bit about. Can you get people to make what on the surface appear to be much smarter choices that will save money and emissions? Then you're in a realm in the middle span, oh, by the way, these are big numbers, these are 10 billion tonnes of CO2 estimated savings by 2030. Uh, that is about a third of current global energy sector emissions. Then uh, an equally or larger slice of stuff, which is positive cost, you have to pay to cut back emissions, but not that much. Broadly, what you're doing there is the zone of substituting cleaner products and processes, but at a, a positive cost. And then over here, you've got the higher cost measures, maybe less developed. Um, carbon capture and storage can be there, lots of other technologies. And in fact, of course, you can expand this further right from here. But the point is, they're by and large options which you, you feel you have identified, but which you believe can have massive scope for innovation, development, cost reduction, etc. So again, these broadly correspond to the three domains that I, I showed you. Um, <coughs> and, and you will note, incidentally, that carbon price in itself is unlikely to solve this problem because people save money anyway. If there's a, some sort of barrier, prices alone are not going to change it. Uh, likewise here, if there's an innovation problem, you have to consider how much is that innovation going to occur due to prices versus other things. Okay. What I found fascinating delving into this is actually in the last two or three decades, it's not just speculation and sort of literature on energy efficiency. There is an underlying literature of broadly the frontiers of economic research, which neatly falls into these categories. M almost all of you now will have heard of behavioral economics. Uh, many may be management, management theory, principal agent theory, yeah. rafts of theoretical development. We say, well, People are not perfect decision makers. Organizations are not perfect. There's all sorts of imperfections and problems that occur that suffuse this whole issue about why there could actually be substantial potential in the first domain. Neoclassical economics itself has developed enormously, particularly looking at, at phenomena like market instability, and boy, we've seen that in the energy sector. Um, and then you've got a whole region of evolutionary economics, institutional economics, long-term structural change, complex systems evolution, and so forth. Um, one thing I found interesting in, sort of in joining Ofgem is it's an organization that was broadly constructed around classical economics, maximize competition, get prices right, job done. Actually, a lot of people in Ofgem are now well aware of behavioral economics and all that stuff because people are not switching suppliers in the most cost effective way, and there's all sorts of barriers. And so, a lot, lot of interest in this. But I think in a lot of public institutions, very little awareness of this. This has hardly got beyond the academic, out of the academic sector, in my experience, into government. They've sort of vaguely heard of it, and, but it's not like seen as a central part of economics, the evolutionary institutional development. But the thing to note is not just here are three different categories. They systematically differ in time and spa spatial or social scale. Um, broadly, in this you're talking about individuals, individual companies, organisations, probably thinking a couple of years ahead, I'll show a little bit of data on that. These theories tend to work best when you've got larger decision makers looking at you know, a decade or two investment or, or, or other such. Here, you tend to be talking about big systems, decades of evolution, international diffusion of technologies, international tr transformation of systems. So there's a scale issue here. These are not alternate explanations of the same thing. Let me just underline that. These are different kinds of theories that apply at different scales. Now, if you are then going to say, so what do we do with it? I mean, okay, fine. I mean, possibly to some of you, what I've said so far sounds like a statement of the obvious. Um, I'd almost like to think it is, but my real world experience suggests it not really sufficiently. What do you do in policy terms? Well, the policies that you adopt need to harness the corresponding characteristics of those domains and to be reasonably well informed by the underlying theories, which leads one to think about policy pillars. And <coughs> let me start with, in a sense, the one that, you know, huge amounts of literature over the last couple of decades saying the optimal response to climate change is a carbon price, everything else is less efficient. 
Well, just wait a minute. Just think more carefully. What a price does, what a market does, is it will act is the best mechanism we know, providing the markets work okay, where people are already consciously trying to optimise and make economic trade-offs. Now, it will have some impact on the other domains. If you have a major price shock, particularly, um, you may, in a sense, kick people into thinking about something they didn't bother to think about before. Now, that, that is more in the satisfaction domain. It's an attention effect. It's attention grabbing. But it may be of short-lived duration. But there will be some spillovers. Likewise, you will have some influence on the sort of transformation innovation processes. Um, so, you know, for a cr really crude, crude way of doing it, we've got highest relevance, medium, lowest relevance. Because actually, if you really want to get at the potential on the left-hand side of the cost curve, I'll come on to nature of the potential, then vast amounts of evidence, and just actually logic when you look at the theories underpinning it, that either you want standards, you just say, look, regulate the really inefficient stuff out of the market. You save loads of transaction costs, you, you, know, you avoid lots and lots of trouble with standards in many ways, or engage people so they become engaged, they become thinking about their energy use, etc. Those are broadly the things that really are of highest relevance if you want to tackle the satisfying domain. It will have some influence on optimising choices, and standards can move people, and, and to some extent on transformation. But basically, that's the combination led by that with pricing certainly helps that would lead people to what you might call smarter choices. And then finally, if what you're trying to do is transform the system and associated innovation and lots of other things, um, as I said, markets, prices of some relevance, but broadly you're in the region of strategic investment. Now, I could say a lot more about this, uh, if time allowed, which I doubt, I, I'd love to go into a bit more as to why, particularly in the energy sector, markets seem to be a very weak driver of innovation. And you really are looking at strategic, strategic investment, primarily led by governments. I'm not going to have time to cover the full matrix, but I hope the broad concept and architecture of the book is now clear. If so, I will just make actually only one observation on key components of the energy system as to how they relate to this, the physical structure of the system. Uh, this is a chart that, personally, I'm quite fond of, um, though I guess tastes vary enormously. Uh, it's, it's basically it's a Sankey diagram. But in, it, it, it's, uh, in other words, it's an energy flows diagram. But I've done two, uh, uh, at least, slightly unorthodox things. First place, I've drawn it back to front, very deliberately. The energy flows from here through to here. The reason is, this is a book about economics and what drives the system. The system is driven by how we use energy in buildings, by our industrial production, and by transport. These are the things that actually make everything else happen. If nobody did any of these things, well, none of the Sankey flows would exist, right? So, in economic value terms, the flow is entirely this way. The other thing is done, I've done is to try and deliberately simplify it. Sankey diagrams are wonderfully complex. People have great fun. I kind of look at them and think, yeah, what does this really mean? But what this means is I've simplified it to saying there are the following blocks we need to deal with. Buildings, industry, transport, fed by energy, or you might say driving the demand for energy from direct fuel systems, electricity, and the refined fuel systems. And these are the basic fossil fuel resources that go into them, preferentially petroleum through that one, and then quite a bit of mixing up across those. But you know, a system that has basically just those, those nine major blocks, or oh, indeed you'd say six major blocks, looks a little bit more manageable, but it also underlines that you're not going to find any single magic bullet. You will not find any magic bullet which addresses all these things, and even decarbonising the power system is only going to deal with parts of it. It's a kind of simple message. Um, in the book, and I think with a reasonable degree of validity, uh, I also do an implicit mapping. This is the one where first domain effects appear to dominate. Building energy use is dominated by first domain effects. Industry, one would hope, and to a degree there's evidence, 
is, is a lot closer to what you'd expect in terms of rational optimizing cost trade-off behavior. If you want to tra transform transport, you are looking at major structural changes, technological changes, institutional changes for um, partly biofuels at scale, but electrification certainly. So if you like, take this as an exemplar of domain one, this is an exemplar of domain two, this is an exemplar of domain three. All are actually, all, I mean, they all cross over, but you can think of it that way. So consequently, under pillar one, I've focused mostly on buildings. But in terms of the overall challenge, let me just give you one, one punchline from the book, which is actually, I argue that insofar as the data can tell you, which is a bit limited to interpret, all three domains are roughly equally important. Now that is a very important statement, if it's true because I can imagine lots of people I know, and you know, I've had the experience of saying, oh, fine, three domains, but actually it's prices that really matter. Although I've had an experience of saying, you think price accounts for a third of it? We're talking about transforming the entire system. This is totally about innovation. Price is irrelevant. And I've had people saying that as well, actually. Um, but no, it's saying, if you want to transform the system, you need to do all three, and they're all equally important. Don't try and pretend one is more important than others. Here are the various bits of evidence which to me suggest that that w conclusion and I will say a little bit more about one of those if the, this time at the end but it's just to say this is not just the McKinsey cost curve there's macroeconomic data there is is the asymmetry and in, in elasticity as I hinted at the Bashmakov constant they broadly to my view are all consistent with that story <coughs> and at the end I will underline the theme that actually those pillars are interdependent they are not competing they are not alternatives if you try any one pillar on its own it will fail now having said that broad background given you a hint of the, the sort of integrating punchline um, I did want to take this opportunity to dig a bit deeper into this first domain and pillar um, Apologise, actually. I think the blurb I offered for this lecture said a certain amount about markets and pricing. Uh, I thought, actually, at UCL, the Energy X Institute here, so much expertise on buildings and systems. Zero in on this one more and maybe take questions beyond a brief comment on markets and pricing. First, let me just underline, for those of you who think it's obvious that there's a huge potential for energy efficiency, uh, most of you will probably know known Dieter Helm and, and, and his book in 2011. And he just said, you know, everybody gets excited about energy efficiency and they are fundamentally wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. There are two major problems with energy efficiency. Uh, one is actually the belief that it will reduce energy demand, big rebound effect. And the other is there's lots of potential there for free. Well, frankly, as an economist, people are not doing it. There's a good reason, which is going to be some kind of hidden costs. So, <coughs> and anyway, if you think you have a problem, the, cost, the price of energy is not high enough to make people do efficiency, well, the is raise prices higher. So, you know, there's some real scepticism around how real is this energy efficiency stuff. And that's why I took the, the time and trouble to delve into considerable depth. First, I think there are all sorts of evidence that at least something strange from an economic standpoint is going on. Not just for individuals where you might expect, yeah, you know, people are kind of, you know, they don't really know much, they maybe don't think. It's, Companies are ex can be extraordinarily wasteful. This is some data from my time at the Carbon Trust. Uh, interestingly, actually, it turned out to be data that we never got around to publishing at the time. So, thanks to the Carbon Trust for letting me uh, put it in this book. What it shows is not just an indication of the potential of different payback times, but actually having gone into companies, surveyed their energy use, and given them a report saying you can do this and this and this and this, and gone back a year later you discover that half of the measures with a less than one year payback have been done. You drop to 30% for measures which would pay back in two years. And, and it doesn't decline very much for measures three to five years or even five to 50. Now, if that's not evidence that you have some sort of behavioral attention related, management related issue, I don't know what is. Because it suggests, I mean, bear in mind these same companies may be making investments at board level with a kind of 15 year payback. Or ten year. Um, so huge asymmetry in the way they're treating energy consumption as an incidental cost that they don't really manage. Uh, they don't have the systems in place. We drill through some of that. But I just thought it was an interesting uh, indicator. You just look at the 
the potential for improvement energy efficiency even with, with a faster than five year payback if you could just get companies to implement half of the stuff that was recommended. Now when you then say so what's the nature of these first domain potentials and what are the various arguments around it this is again the McKinsey curve zeroed in on that left hand side and you discover the different kinds of elements obviously you can aggregate these in various ways I chose a level of aggregation that I hope is reasonably clear so here domestic buildings electric so things like light bulbs efficiencies commercial buildings electric significant wastage in petroleum and gas industries commercial building theories transport efficiency sorry these bars are not that clear then waste clinker substitution chem and here you're looking at the general industrials as well so it's not just buildings but buildings are the one where it seems to be biggest and clearest by and large and then you enter the arguments about how real is this and I just eventually haven't got really tired in some ways of all these arguments about does energy efficiency exist I added in this which basically tries to capture the economic scepticism says, well, there's clearly hidden costs that explain this. It's not real. In other words, it's not really as cost effective as it looks at all. This whole thing is false. It's really up there. You talk to building experts, and they say, no, 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 McKinsey actually substantially underestimated the potential for buildings because they did bit by bit, and they didn't consider whole buildings' potentials of refurbishment, which actually means the whole thing should expand that way. Then you get arguments about rebound effects, which say, no, actually, um, sorry guys, but you may do this, but quite a lot of it will be taken back. More efficient, people use more because it's cheaper. And then you get the other debates around co-benefits. And the IEA itself said, well, actually, this stuff doesn't really matter because even if there was no financial saving, the health benefits of insulating buildings better would pay for themselves in terms of reduced costs on, on health services. So, you know, you can push this curve any way you want, depending upon what you want to believe and stuff, on the arguments you pick. But definitely, I find the, the sort of the classic economic scepticism is, shall we say, a highly selective use of the various possibilities uh, around, you know, where you'd argue and push this curve. Um, <coughs> so, how do you explain such a potential? Well, this is my best attempt. Uh, and there are lots of literature on barriers. Um, when at the Carbon Trust, we did quite a major study, and we tried to classify the barriers into four main categories. You can even talk about whether barriers is right. The interesting, the academic literature is almost entirely about barriers. A lot of the businesses talk about drivers. What, what will actually make somebody get up and do something about this? It's not just an absence of barriers. But anyway, they both fall into four categories. Issues around financial costs, payback criteria, time horizons, hidden and intangible costs, which obviously in some cases are very important, various categories, management time, your own time and so forth. Market misalignments, split incentives, tenant landlord is the classic one, though actually I think there are quite a few other examples when you drill down. And then the fourth category is behavioural factors. A loose term for everything really that sits under the hood of that first theoretical uh, level that I showed you. Behavioural economics is fascinating when you really dig down all issues around loss. Loss aversion, well, let's get that. It's, 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 it's a, a term about how people look at financial horizons at different levels. Biases and risk, tendency to procrastination. Um, and, and you get into the literature says, well, it's not surprising from a psychological perspective we have trouble tackling these issues because all this energy and climate stuff is psychologically very remote. People feel distant from it, don't have agency over it, they're not really going to do anything. So you, know, you have a huge raft of different kinds of explanations as to why this stuff doesn't happen. Uh, some of that, incidentally, you can come on as positive as well and would give a hint as to where you might try and look for triggers to change behaviour. But it seems pretty clear the balance is, you know, and the evidence supports the fact that the barriers very much outweigh the drivers to more efficient energy use. Um, <coughs> it may sound a little odd, but I also found it quite interesting to take a quick peek and some official in DEC actually dug out 
something a little bit like this, which is just how, how do people take decisions, or at least what determines their actions? And this apparently is considered one of the more complex theories of decision making. Looks to me pretty simple, but it basically says, well actually, people have intentions, but they also have an awful lot of habits. And very frequently the habits are going to get in the way of the intentions. And even if the habits don't dominate over the intentions, then there's an awful lot of facilitating conditions required for people to actually be able to, to implement their intentions. And, you know, we've just put a few, you know, dotted that box with a few examples of the kind of facilitating conditions that you would need to enable people to respond to their intentions even if their habits weren't dominating. But just the point is, you know, one really does need, if you're going to be serious about first domain economics or first domain behaviours and policies, you need to dig into theories of how people actually take decisions and how organisations structure their decision making uh, and then sort of feed energy efficiency into that to, to work out. In terms of the empirical evidence, and in each pillar, incidentally, I've tried to sort of do a, a nature of the problem, the theory of the problem, and the evidence of what we've tried, and then where does that lead us in terms of the chapters. This is just one slightly complicated, but I think very powerful chart around the impact of uh, legally binding legislation on labelling of refrigeration and, and subsequently standards on refrigeration in the EU. And in effect, to, uh, going from the first introduction in 1993 to, to 2005, you, you see just uh, basically all of the inefficient appliances got wiped out of the market remarkably quickly. You were very quickly in the zone dominated by a class C, B, and then they found a problem because they'd started with A as the most efficient and they had to start inventing A plus and A plus uh, plus. And actually we've got an A triple plus uh, freezer in our house. You know, so the response has been much has been big and bigger than anyone expected to a regulatory intervention. Uh, and that's that's quite important data and, and insight and that pattern is repeated in other areas. Um, and pri you know, that's, that's not a price driven that is driven by the policies that were adopted on energy efficiency. That said, you can populate a discussion with lots of great stories about energy efficiency but then when you look and the success of efficiency policies but when you look at the aggregate data it remains troubling. 1970s huge oil shock, 1980s quite a lot of efficiency programs beginning to come in, ratcheted up a lot in 1990. What's actually happened in the IEA, uh, IEA countries, broadly the rich country club, we have saved a lot of energy, at least relative to GDP growth, but it's not been enough to stabilise energy use. And moreover, rapid increases in the decade or two after the oil shocks slowed down a lot, this is the energy efficiency improvements, has actually been less than 1% a year since 1990, since energy was cheap. This of course leads me by no accident onto the emphasis that don't think that efficiency policies alone can deliver, think about the interaction with prices and other influences. But just one final thing before I move off the evidence around the, the, the first domain, first pillar issues, which is to, to, to pose ourselves the question, pose myself the question in this, of have we actually sort of begun to run the barrel dry on energy efficiency? I mean, in one sense it will never run dry because the frontier will keep moving and so people, you know, countries will gradually get left behind unless they continue to make efforts to get to the technology frontier. But, uh, but at a more general level, apart from that, have we kind of learnt all the tools in the toolbox? And my conclusion was, we've done a lot, made a lot of progress on the efficiency of stock, buildings, appliances. Doesn't mean everything is efficient, but it means broadly we now have quite a good raft of policy tools to drive improved efficiency of stock, of products. Um, we've made a lot less progress around the efficiency of use. Now, uh, it remains to me one of the big unknowns is actually how far can we go here. I've never forgotten a line that um, an energy scientist called Lee Shipper said to me, looking at the 1970s efforts, which though were broadly sort of, you know, a lot of public relations campaigning, he said, actually, 
things we've done that have changed things have made a big impact. Things we've done that have tried to change people haven't. I think it was a neat way of summarising the sheer difficulty, but nevertheless I'm not convinced we've really worked this through. I think there's a lot more we've discovered in behavioural economics and other stuff which could help about how people actually use the bits of kit they've got. Where I think we have hardly started is around the question of embodied energy. And I think I, I think I know, oh sorry. I had one chart in there which is I've seen the concept duplicated now both for vehicles and for buildings, which is if we are successful about the efficiency of use in either vehicles, particularly electric vehicles, and buildings, then within another decade or two the energy used to make those things is going to be bigger than the entire lifetime of using them. In which case we have a problem. And we need to start thinking about whether and how you get people, systems, to buy stuff which has been made in more efficient ways or less emitting ways. And this, I think, is, is an area we've hardly scratched the surface of in terms of energy efficiency policy. We've been so focused on emissions at point of use. But I think we've got to start digging on that right-hand column. Um, okay. So, I have now been running for close to the 45 minutes. I'm going to make one point about uh, markets and prices relationship. I'm going to skip strategic investment, but I must say a little bit about policy integration. So the one point about markets and pricing uh, is uh, uh, broadly as follows. I spent quite a bit of my career working on emissions, trading, economic instruments, that kind of thing. And it's fascinating. When one thinks about price, you think a cap and trade system has broadly solved the problem. You've generated a price, you've capped emissions, great. Problems with instability, we know all that, worked on it. One thing that seems to make people very twitchy is when you point out to them that once you've set a cap, nothing that anybody does actually saves emissions. I've I, I actually seen this in Ofgem. Some people say, well, actually, should we count carbon reductions from doing this because it's not going to save any carbon because it's all capped under the European trading scheme so we reduce our emissions in Britain it just means some other country can emit more and this was a big issue in the politics of the Australian cap and trade scheme people were saying all you're going to do with, with, with this cap and trade scheme you take efficiency measures all you will do is make the utilities richer and you won't save any carbon now if you think that in the first domain motivations are important and non-economic motivations are important, that means you've got a problem with cap and trade systems. Um, ah, oh no, where did that slide go that I had inserted? Let me just check, it may be a, a hidden one here, yes it is, As apologies, uh, it's because I basically blocked out the whole of the, the pillar two stuff. So this is just one uh, illustrate, I don't have time to go into great detail, the title will tell you something. If first domain personal motivation is relevant, it does imply we have some questions to ask about designing cap and trade scheme and what it does to those personal motivations. But interestingly, that question starts to dovetail with a current very live debate in Europe about how to stabilise the European trading scheme. And basically, the proposition that's emerged is if the carbon price goes too low, or equivalently, the amount of surplus allowances in the system becomes too big, you have some mechanism to kick in that removes the surplus allowances from the system to prevent the whole thing crashing. Um, the interesting feature is, what that means is, when the price is fairly high, saving emissions reduces the price. However, everybody knows that you're never going to go down here, so the risks of holding on to allowances are lower, with a price floor or equivalent mechanism, which means that as the price goes, the more that people do to cut their own emissions or efficiency, etc., the more actually comes out as really saving emissions. You start, so, so here it's all price saving, but I don't know if this is making sense, I'm compacting it rather a lot. But there is a, a sense in which talking about price corridors and ceilings on emissions trading schemes also means that individuals are now themselves in their actions. Uh, doing things that uh, affect a balance of both the price of carbon and actually the amount of carbon that will be emitted for, because of these kind of containment mechanisms. Sorry, maybe that was a bit too much to pack in, but I thought it was an interesting relationship. Okay, I'm going to skip all of the um, third. Okay, 
all of the uh, remainder of the second and third domain issues <coughs> to stress one point that jumped out at me very strongly indeed when I started writing the concluding chapter of this book which was you have bodies of people with energy efficiency people doing economic instruments people doing innovation um, generally thinking that's the thing that really makes a difference and actually I was struck at how strong the case is that any one of those pillars on its own will fail in fact none of them is big enough to credibly solve the problem on their own but worse than that they will actually fail and you could say that the mess we've got into today is partly because we relied too heavily on second domain theories to the exclusion of the other things why would we fail? Well, energy efficiency on its own, despite all the potential I showed you, is limited by the fact that you know, the closer you want to try and get to the efficiency frontier, the more you've got to intervene in all sorts of energy choices and standards. And you just got to get governments have to get more and more and more intimately involved in pushing things to ever closer to the frontier. So you know, it becomes very interventionist. Potentially, a lot of you know queries raised about the, how, how far can and should governments go. Also, the more effective you are, of course, the cheaper you're making it to do all the things that consume energy, the more careless and wasteful people will get, because it doesn't cost them anything, which leads to large rebound effects. And you can, you know, there's lots of literature now, and I think broadly it's fair to say the academic community has concluded rebound is actually a more serious problem than they used to think or wanted to, to believe. But, you know, just driving efficiency will eventually kill itself in terms of solving the problem unless you actually have something which is driving up the price of energy at the same time um, but don't pretend relying on price in itself will solve the problem because as I've indicated plant is, price is actually quite a blunt instrument when what you're dealing with is first and third domain uh, problems and if you are not having strong efficiency policies and you are stuck in the world of you know, elasticities of minus 0.2, minus 3, you really are driving up energy bills. And boy, have we seen how much people don't like that. And eventually, I mean, the, the whole idea of anyone in Europe is going to take radical reform to the EU ETS to drive up the carbon price to 30 or 40 euros at the moment is high in the sky. The politics would kill it instantly, given the politics of fuel price bills. So, and then the concerns about industrial competitiveness, etc. <coughs> price on its own reaches its own limits unless you're making progress on energy efficiency which helps to manage energy bills and on innovation which can help to manage the competitiveness concerns <coughs> innovation on its own however as a policy largely supply push is limited and I didn't have time to go through this but it really is seriously limited how much you can expect from breakthrough technologies if you haven't done any of these things which is what would actually drive the demand for cleaner innovations um, and consequently the scale and risk you're putting all your eggs in the basket of basically government centrally planned technology programs trying to roll out into markets where you're not doing the things that would, would drive the incentives again it will ultimately fail um, and we've seen examples of huge government technology failures where they thought they knew the answer and the markets didn't. So it's actually the combination of all three of these things that is really has the potential to change course, which is I think the, the key strategic need. I've tried to summarise it in this chart. So you have the first pillar, standards and engagement, second markets and pricing, third, strategic investment. And energy efficiency helps you to manage the bill implications of price increases. It may increase the consumer responsiveness to price increases. Prices, in, in turn, will generate carbon revenues, which may help to fund efficiency programs, reveal the costs of the various technologies at pay, and <coughs> give more strategic value to innovations in the third domain, or under the third pillar policies. In turn, those technology innovation infrastructure policies will generate more options with which people can respond to carbon pricing, can help industries innovate at a pace which means they get competitiveness gain from the decarbonised agenda in many cases. And again, carbon pricing will feed in uh, to raising attention in first domain the products and the financing of some of those. And there are direct links there. I think consumer pull is actually one of the strongest drivers of innovation 
we don't have strong consumer pull in energy because it's a completely undifferentiated product. Likewise, in this domain, you're talking about education, access, and control. For example, smart meters directly feed into consumer engagement. So to me now, I've very much come to think of this as a package. You need all three of them. You need to understand how they fit together. And if you're thinking, yeah, well, fine, that's kind of fairly obvious. I don't know. I'd be interested to know how many people are thinking about that. You just have to remember the scale of political angst in Europe. Say, oh, God, these renewable energy targets are screwing up the emissions trading scheme. Or energy efficiency is messing up the emissions trading scheme because they are encroaching. If you view these instruments as competing, you do not understand what it is we actually have to deliver, in my view. Um, just an additional way into emphasizing, I'm sorry if I'm banging on at this theme, another way into it is to recognize there is no unified decision maker. Not only is there no global decision maker of the sort represented in global optimizing trajectories, in any society there's lots of different decision makers taking different kinds of decisions motivated by different kinds of instruments. For some of them, a target will be important, a cap will be important, some price target, some consumer brand aware. You know, there are lots of different factors driving lots of different decisions, which again in this chart, without taking further time on it, I've mapped in a way where you can see the sort of parallels that begin to emerge with these three domains of, of decision making according to the types of decisions and decision makers. Um, that in itself is quite an interesting chart sometimes to spend a little time on. Another thing that drops out of the, the integration effort when you look across the three domains is there really is something credible in the discussion of co-benefits. Again, if you take a really classical economic framework, it says there may or may not be co-benefits, but you optimise everything separately. Right? You, you, you think there are health gains to certain efficiency policies, well you do it for health reasons. China has a problem with air pollution, clean up local air pollution. Don't confuse it with climate policy or anything. To my mind that is just neither correct economics and it's certainly very bad politics because any policy needs to require multiple stakeholders. But in reality what certainly I found working through this across the three pillars is well, first of all, the, 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 the first and the third are not optimising processes at all. There is no reason if you're in a satisfying domain to think that you don't have co-benefits. You would expect to find co-benefits. It's almost one of the definitions of being in the first domain. Likewise, we know full well, shed loads of economics, that societies systematically underinvest in innovation. And there's no reason to think the direction of innovation is optimal either. So you would expect to find co-benefits in the first and third domain, and in fact various reasons why you, you, you can have a very good uh, prospect in the second. The interesting question to my mind is not could there be co-benefits, but how is it that climate change, and what might be the role of climate policy in relation to co-benefits? And I think broadly I came up with the answer that there are occasions when concern about climate change may motivate you to do things you wouldn't otherwise. I mean, think about the first domain. Actually, it's none of government's business if people are wasting loads of money by using energy efficient, inefficiently. But if they are trying to cut emissions, it is government's business to try and do it as efficiently as possible. So you know, it can motivate actions which would not otherwise occur. There will be some things in the climate arena which may help to stabilise energy markets for investment purposes, certainly. There is, I see in Ofgem, a real way in which our you know, strategic renewables targets act as a coordinating advice. We're going to have to go there, therefore we need to think about supply chains, the transmission infrastructure, all of the ducks lined up in a row to deliver the targets. And of course carbon finance potentially could be a very large thing and the interesting thing is how best would one use that. So I end up actually with quite a, a positive view on, should we say, the integrated economics of climate change once you've really worked through these three domains. But one has to keep them all in mind and think about how they interact, reinforce, and what opportunities do they create. And I think I have taken almost an hour, and I had better stop. You had. Thank you. It hadn't been so fascinating, Mike, I would have interrupted you. <laughs> Okay, we 
are going to have some Q&A. Michael, would you like just to sit down? Because I'd like to take two or three questions at once, just so that we get maximum thing, and then you can seamlessly roll your answers into a synthetic hole. Gentleman at the front here is very keen. You are, so you can say who you are, and in the interest of time, please be as brief as you can while making your point. And we do welcome comments as well as questions. Please. Uh, Edwards, architect. Uh, we do a lot of energy efficiency work. Um, you're talking about energy efficiency and embodied energy. Sounds very, very important. Uh, some points that I, I would. Uh, I'm certain about what you were saying. I'm sure the embodied energy is very important. Uh, the energy efficiency, you think that lots has been done already. But uh, just briefly give an example of my, my own home in a north, in a north London suburb. There's about 3,500 homes. Half of them are social housing. Average cost of a million. And uh, one in seven in now, the efficiency, as far as I know quite a lot about it because we had a lot of social community organisation. One house has had 100 millimetres of insulation put on it. That's the Green Party councillor who uh, knows a lot about it. One house, the Conservation Committee chairman, has had 10 millimetres of insulation put on inside, which is uh, totally unknowledgeable. I don't think anybody else has. Some of them got uh, the old 1960s segregated. The other thing is appliances. I think, no, in other words, the point is, I think a lot about efficiencies is in London. Uh, mm. Very few people are doing efficiencies. It, it, the point we're making about them being, uh, uh, having to be balanced by higher mm. prices is very important. The other thing, appliances, then, very quickly, boiler and washing machine, in my own experience, we have a boiler uh, that's still about five years old. We're told the average is 10 years life now and that it's getting worse the uh, embodied energy. Uh, ideal boilers said when I spoke to them, their technical uh, technician, oh, about seven years ours last now. The other you one, we can't go into as much detail. Yes, yeah. right. absolutely. Was it seen similar? Uh, ours broke down. Okay, can we years. move on? Uh, efficiency yeah. is not being done as much as it should be. Uh, Gavin Kirk, University of Oxford. Uh, thank you for your talk, Michael. Um, in addition to all this thing on domains. Would you say something about politics? Because um, and the, the example that I have in mind is the difference we've had with the current government with and the sudden rush to introduce public legislation there versus, for example, some of the first main things that this gentleman was talking about, which hadn't been supported yeah. in anything like the same way, the kind of consistent vision and consistent leadership. Yeah. and then we'll ask, come back to you. Andrew Ross from Global Garden. The talk here last week was on stranded assets and the gigantic carbon bubble which the financial markets are now becoming aware of. How does that paradigm shift factor into your analysis? Three very different questions. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I apologise if I gave the impression that I said, oh, we're, we've actually done really well at delivering efficiency. Um, <coughs> one reason I put back to that is, I think, if you go roll back 20 years, there's quite a lot of engineering literature which said we can be really efficient and it will be all cost effective, so it's going to be really easy. When you look at the list of barriers on the left, you realise, who would have thought this was going to be easy? Just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's easy. And that's actually a very fundamental point about first domain economics is I'm saying it really is cheap there's a lot of evidence but that does not make it easy however it does mean that sorry so the, the reference I made to good progress is I think that we have now de developed and deployed quite a wide raft of policy instruments which have begun to deliver that potential and you can run through standards, through the CERT scheme, the CES scheme, the all sorts of stuff. Um, Ofgem runs some of those. You know, we certify 3.5 million houses insulated under CES, which is still what 20% of the British housing stock or less. So, delivery, there's still a way to go. All I'm saying is, in policy terms. I think we have made substantial progress, and a lot of that progress has been positive, but slower than hoped. 
and the impact has not been as big or as quick as hoped. There is still a long way to go. Do not imagine domain one is all done and dusted. It's not. Especially in North London. Especially in North London. Um, <coughs> the politics. Um, yeah, I, it's a really interesting question. We could spend loads of time on it. Um, I actually originally intended to, to write a somewhat more political book and, and I veered off concluding that actually one of the problems in politics was the obsession, or the, the, the belief in the policy community that this was fundamentally a problem of second domain economics and externality and the question was how much were we willing to spend and how did we distribute the burdens and how could we design a global carbon cap and trade scheme to get a global carbon price. That was the problem definition in the 1990s and it has failed. Um, I mean, that's a strong statement, but, but you know, it's, it's clearly struggled to deliver what, what's needed. And I concluded it's partly because actually we didn't understand the economics well enough, and the economics actually involved all these three domains and how they all fit together, how they reinforce. And I think that is, um, no regrets about that decision, because as I worked through it, I realised, well, it's not surprising people it's not surprising we've struggled to deliver if what we thought we were doing was having to impose a cost for the global good environmental benefit. Because in effect what you're saying is we want to drive up your carbon price, we want you to incur a burden for a long-term, diffuse, nebulous, uncertain benefit. And international negotiations are all about fighting about how much burden are you willing to bear. Well, any social scientist or international relations theorist can tell you your chances of success are pretty bad if that's the way you've defined the problem. The interesting thing in this is it's saying, look, get this right, and this is no longer a problem of burden sharing and beating you up with a carbon price for which you can see no tangible benefit. This is an integrated package which is intended and potentially can keep your energy bills constant as the price goes up. And that as part of that package, not only will you be paying some revenues on prices, but you will be seeing all the benefits of energy efficiency program, all of the innovation benefits. You know, actually, all of the stakeholder interest, the stakeholder value is in the third and third domains. The second domain is just a bit of a problem. You do have to have higher prices to make the equations work. But trying to do the politics on the basis of driving up prices is, is on a hiding to nothing in terms of the actual politics. So I actually think that recasting the economics in this kind of way is a necessary precursor to reconstructing a viable politics. Um, and sorry, the third one. Stranded assets. Stranded assets. Well, you had a whole seminar. I don't think I could add much other than the fact that I think people who work on climate change and that stranded assets are being a bit, na a bit naive if they think, oh look, we've got lots of these stranded assets which silly people are holding which are clearly going to be radically devalued. What it shows is that those people don't believe that you've constructed a politics that will work and the world never is going to stick anywhere near two degrees. So they're not stranded assets. That's basically what they believe. And one of the chapters in the third pillar of the book, chapter 10, is about evolutionary economics and systems and frankly it's quite a scare it's an odd chapter because I find it both scary and hopeful at the same time the scary bit is the idea that these systems self optimize is fantasy these systems have an enormous inertia and innovation such as happens in the energy sector, 90% of innovation is done by companies who make all their money out of fossil fuels and that is their comparative knowledge and advantage. What do you expect them to spend their innovation money on? You know, funding solar cells where somebody's going to take their business away from them? You know, they're going to fund improving the ability to dig carbon out of the ground and chuck it in the atmosphere more cheaply. That's what their business is. So there is a tremendous inbuilt inertia and self-perpetuation and path dependence in these systems. The hopeful bit is you can actually trace transformative strategies across all the major sectors I started with. Um, and it's, you know, you just need to think a bit imaginatively and then work out how do you construct the politics to achieve those transformations. Do governments believe in stranded assets? 
uh, governments are not a unified beast. That was the second, second bite of the cherry, I'm afraid. Um, are there any other questions that we're going to get? We have a question at the front here. Paul Patterson, Chatham House. I have been preoccupied for a long time with a very simple problem, which is that when Edison first set up his electric light system, he was selling, he charged his customers according to how many lamps they had. <coughs> And he had to optimize the entire system in order to be able to keep the cost at least barely tolerable to the clients. Then in, in 1885, we invented the electricity meter, at which point Edison was no longer selling illumination or the availability of illumination. Electricity by the unit as measured by the meter, at which point it was no longer in his interest to optimize the whole system. It was in his interest and those of to sell as much electricity as they could, and therefore it was in their interest to use inefficient lamps and motors and other appliances. And that same perverse incentive still seems to be central to what we call the energy supply system in the world. That it is in, as you said just now, it is the fossil fuel companies and the electricity companies gain their revenue by selling units. And it is therefore fundamentally politically against their interests for us to raise the performance of our buildings or our lamps or our appliances and so on. You have a, a critical political problem there, which I have never been able to see a way around. Right. As long as you continue to think that what matters is selling electricity or fuel by the unit and the unit price. Um, I. I mean, I certainly partially agree. Uh, obviously, if if you didn't have these strong first domain characteristics, it wouldn't matter because you could rely on the consumers to manage their energy optimally with respect to the price they were being charged. And that is, in a sense, how one would hope the market would work, and you would decentralise the decisions on energy efficiency to the people who are actually consuming the energy. You know, I think there's a legitimate question of should supply companies be made responsible for the efficiency of how their product is used. Um, however, that said, I think um, it is a problem. I. I, I just get mixed impressions as to how big a problem it is in reality. Governments, I think, have gone some way, particularly in electricity, where it's, it's a net, you, you've got the monopoly networks, it is regulated. A lot of governments have introduced schemes which require the companies to deliver efficiency with, I think, mixed... I, well, it's against their interest unless the regulation says you, you get paid this much. But yes, it, it is. You're, all, you're always slightly pushing up uphill, which is why I think this engagement aspect of first domain, pol first pillar policies is actually very important. Because I think you do need the, the consumers to be, to be more engaged. The alternate, <coughs> as you yourself, Walt, has written about, is actually try and step back from per unit sales and try and restructure it to say, actually, we're moving to a world where this is basically about integrate in infrastructure. Uh, in which the marginal cost is kind of almost irrelevant to anybody. It is what is the efficient capital stock that will deliver light from capital intensive renewable resources powered by free wind or sun. Okay, we're going to take two more questions. One from this gentleman, one from me. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to stop. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Simon Brooks. I, I used to work for the European Investment Bank on climate policy and climate change. Um, and my question really links to the previous one, and, and that is, in most other domains of um, anti-pollution, let me put it like that, we have adopted a standards approach. So when we want to become <coughs> power stations, we made a regulation to stop it, and then yeah. companies had to fall in that. More widely, we've seen international trade a move to standards generally, including labour standards, uh, how you catch the fish, and that has become a more and more important part of the way the international trade is operates. What is it, I have my own answer this, but what is it that makes carbon different? Why do we use standards and regulations for everything else, trying to emphasize price on carbon? <laughs> Now, there's an intriguing question. Paul, you've probably got your views on that as well. Um, 
I, w I would think it's a confluence of two things. One is just timing, almost the zeitgeist. Um, as one emerged from the late 1980s, collapse of communism, the Washington Consensus, liberalization, you know, very much the view was we've discovered the key to efficient economic management and it is market liberalization and competition. Oh, here's a problem. Uh, its economists recognize this kind of problem. It's called an externality. They've been writing for at least since, what, 1927, Coase's theorem and, and Pijou, that actually the efficient thing to do is to set a price. And since we're all now marketeers, let's set a price. I think the other reason is that there aren't many problems as diffuse and pervasive as this. And I think there is a very good argument that it's incredibly onerous to try and regulate carbon in all of its manifestations, all these various bits of the energy system. Surely it's just far better and more feasible to set a price and let the magic of the market actually generate the optimal response. And I think there's quite a lot of legitimacy in that, but as I've indicated, I think it has its limits. Thank you. I wanted to just ask you to reflect on the economics uh, profession. You quoted Dieter Helm there. Um, some of us will have read Rob Stavin's quote from Harvard University, commenting on the European Union's regulatory decisions this week. <coughs> saying, um, Thank God they didn't set any te rubbishy technology standards because we yes. know that the only way to get this <coughs> solved efficiently is to have a single emissions target and a single emissions price, which is Stevens is an influential uh, economics commentator. It's a very, very common view. So the thought that that second domain is going out of fashion in terms of uh, economic commentators is completely wrong. It is still absolutely dominant. And yet, as you say, the empirical evidence of both the existence of domains one and three and the possible effectiveness of policy that addresses those domains seems to be uh, unarguable, because there's lots of it, and you yourself, you've cited a bit of it. What is going on here in terms of the way in which people who like to think economically like you and me are captured by domain two, so that um, we imagine that this is a <coughs> You did ask a nice, easy question, didn't you? Um, First, uh, well, one, one comment, um, there's several things I'd like to say. First, I've been really trying in this whole work to stress that it is not, not a work that's trying to bash economics. It's a work which is trying to say, where do certain forms of economics actually fit parts of the problem and where do other sorts of economics fit other parts of the problem? That actually the debate is not about, you know, do we believe in economics or not? Do we beat it up or not? And there's, there's, there's loads of... People have been bashing economics for decades. It's a, it's a very well-run sport that's had almost no impact on policy. So I'm trying to do something different. I'm trying to say, well, let's have a sensible discussion about where are the boundaries around which this theory works for this part of the problem and this theory actually works better for that part of the problem. Um, so that's the first thing to emphasize. Uh, price remains extremely important in a number of the fields, certainly, that I'm, I'm interested in, that, 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 that you are. And markets remain by far the best delivery mechanism for lots of things. So first, this is about trying to understand where the theories work and where they don't, uh, rather than whether they're right or wrong. That's the first thing. Second, I guess having spent too much time on this book, I had come out the other end thinking, actually, this has just ended up as 500 pages of statement of the obvious. And then I read things like Dieter Helm's comments, and I read an article in the American Economic Review about the economics of energy efficiency, which I cite at some depth in a footnote, uh, because it, was, it, it, it runs you through it's such a little equation about assuming optimal investment, and then it tries to compare it with empirics. I think, great, actually, they've, they've got it that you need to compare it with empirics. And buried in the details, it says, and actually this stuff seems to be much cheaper, but of course we haven't talked hidden costs, so let's assume that hidden costs account for 70% extra. Then, 
we can restore our prior assumption, which is the whole thing was rational and explained by hidden costs anyway. I mean, it's a ridiculous exercise to say, you know, have a theory, want to test it, the data doesn't fit the theory, so I'll add 70% of hidden costs so that the theory works. I mean, come on, guys, it's the American Economics Review. Um, and then I read Stevens, and I think, yeah, actually, maybe I am glad that I've waded through this book, because I do think there is still a problem that, that the second domain sort of has, has a tendency to try and assume it's explaining the whole universe. Um, what lies behind that, I think, is a delicate question, and genuinely delicate. We actually discussed, and I, I, I had two contributing authors in the book, we discussed whether to include an appendix on that, decided it would be so political that actually we just get the book out and see what the reaction was, and then if lots of people try and beat us up, then to say, well, hang on a minute, why are people so resistant to this idea? Well, this is basically just like physics, right? For two centuries, physics did Newtonian mechanics, thought it explained the whole universe, then you discover that it doesn't work for the very small and the very big. And all we're saying is something like climate change involves an awful lot of the very small, i.e. 7 billion decision makers around the planet, and an awful lot of the very big, massive global complex systems evolving over decades. Is it any surprise that we need a slightly more sophisticated toolbox? Um, However, since you are clearly pushing me to say something a bit more controversial, I do think that we have a confluence of problems. One is, it's very hard to empirically test quite a lot of economic things. Uh, I mean, behavioural economics has only made headway because we've got developed empirical techniques. In the absence of empirical tests, you, you have a great tendency for theory to dominate because you can always sort of fudge the empirics to try and pretend that it fits. And then you feel more comfortable. Then your theory is not... I mean, you know, none of us like having our theories challenged. Theories are lovely things. You know, there's that old phrase about, you know, the tragedy of science is when a beautiful theory is slain by an ugly fact. It's a very profound saying. People don't like ugly facts intruding on their theories. Particularly when those theories are actually extraordinarily elegant, mathematically beautiful, and they deliver also a one, two, two wonderful policy implications, one of which is private interests are aligned with the public interest, and markets are the mechanism for doing that. Now that's one belief that you really do not want to let hold of. And the other is, if you're an incumbent, if you're an incumbent industry, second name economics says you're incumbent because you are the best, which is a great thing to believe. And it's very annoying to be told, no, you're only an incumbent because you're an incumbent and you can therefore be able to fix all the rules that keep you there and that there's no reason to assume that that's actually the best outcome for the economy. So I think you've got a confluence of lots of different factors which make people so keen to hold on to the principles and the ideas that underpin the neoclassical view of the world and tend to kind of either just not believe the other things or to, to dismiss them as peripheral. Thank you very much. <coughs> That's a bit to your question about fracking. Okay. <laughs>